Welcome to today's webinar, Parametric Modeling of an Art Bridge. My name is Gallant. I will model this art bridge together with you and I will show you how you can use parameters to enhance your modeling experience in RFM and also how you can easily create moving loads on, for example, such a rope road bridge as we model it today. Our road bridge is 60 meter long and 8 meters wide and the parameter we want to adjust is the height of the arc. My colleagues Andreas and Wieland will help me throughout the webinar and will answer your questions. That's the control panel you see and you can show and hide the control panel by clicking the orange button up here and you can, answer, uh, you can ask questions by using the chat options. Before we start, I want to emphasize what the main objectives of this webinar are. I will give you an introduction into parametric modeling in RFM. I will explain many possibilities you have, but we will obviously use only some of them in the model we create today. We will model the bridge together, where I show you how to enter parameters, how to enter functions, and of course you will see how easy it is at the end to adjust your model. In our case, we will be able to adjust the rise of the arc. Throughout the modeling process, you will see how to define materials, cross-sections, but also nodes, members, and supports. There are always many different ways in RFM to achieve what you want to model. A few of them are shown today. Once we finish with the model, we want to apply some loads, but I have to emphasize here, from the beginning on, we will not consider all required loads necessary to design a bridge. We neglect wind, brake application, vehicle impact, and so on. We only consider self-weight and the load model 1 as defined in the Eurocode 1 part 2. The load model 1 will be created with the help of the additional module RF move surface. I will explain how this module is working and we will use it for our example. Finally, we will combine the created load cases, which is quite simple in our special case. We let RFM do the calculation for us and we'll have a look to forces and stresses at the end. So I switch to the RFM surface. So that's the first dialog you see when you open RFM. We create a new model and I wrote already provided a model name. So we just call our model ArcBridge webinar today and I already adjusted the project name and so on. We classify our loads and combinations in accordance to the Eurocode 0 and as we don't want to apply a specific national annex, I use the European national annex with all its recommendations. So we come back to this later on. For now, that's all we have to do in this dialog. I just click OK and the three-dimensional um, window opens in RFM. So as I said, the bridge is 60 meter long, so we are going to define the first single member, which will be a member type beam, and we have to define a new cross section. There are several ways in RFM to define cross sections, and I will show you a few ways to actually do this. The first one is we create a new cross section, we go into the library, and that's the rectangular hollow section we want to define. So we click onto this, onto this and I define the, the dimensions we need. So it's the height is 1300, the width and the, the wall thickness is 25. So the material, it's already set. If you, in case you have to change this, you can edit material. You can go into the library here as well and can set a material category steel and you can do it in accordance to any standard you want. So there are many standards available. I have chosen the steel S450. So I just click OK. Now I see the cross section I have actually defined. You can double check all the dimensions. I click OK and close the last dialog. I do I have to define it now graphically, so my first point is zero, the coordinate system, and the second point I define it by typing it in this window, it's 60 meter long, zero in Y and Z direction, and I press enter to apply this, and now I click 
my right mouse button to enter the command, to finish the command. So that's a 60 meter long member and I want to divide it into 11, I want to define 11 intermediate nodes to divide it in actually 12 parts. So I have now 12 single members defined quite quickly. I want to adjust my grid slightly so you can go into settings of a work plane and can adjust the grid dynamically according to the size of the model. So, so that's the first beam we have defined and now we want to define the nodes of the arc and to do this I have to explain you a bit about parametric modeling in RFM. So we go back to our slides and in RFM you can access a list of parameters that's available in the edit menu. I will show you this in the example then. In there you can define any parameter names you want. This is just your choice. You can enter a value directly or you can enter a formula and RFM is doing the calculation for you. You can provide a range of values which is basically a minimum and a maximum value. So you, RFM gives you a warning in case you are below the minimum. And you can change the unit type which is kind of a pre-choice for the units, so you can change to weight per length or elastic, elasticity module, for example, and you can then afterwards change the unit from meter to millimeter, or you can use inch or square feet or whatever you prefer. You can access a list of operators, list of functions, so RFM is helping you provide what's available, so most of them are quite easy to understand, so plus, minus, multiply, I don't have to explain you this. You have functions like sinus or absolute. A, more, a bit more difficult is, for example, the function get CS par, get cross-section parameter, so you can access any cross-section value you need, therefore you need the cross-section number and you need an ID value. In this case, that's, most of them are easy to understand as well. So EY, IY is the, the inertial moment. You can always use the dollar signs to access any cell in any table. So that's the table number we want to access, and that's the cell, so similar to Excel. So that's quite common sense. In case you use such a function, you have to know that all calculations are done internally in Newton meter, kilogram in seconds and so on. So the standard SI units are used and further details are provided in the manual in section 11.6. Next slide will go into detail. So that's the, a bit a mathematical slide, but don't be scared. So that's basically just the function describing the bending line of a simple supported beam. And here is a picture showing the, the arc, so the optimum shape of an arc can be defined with the bending line. And we have to define node 14 till 18, so and that's just the x over l, it's just the position on the x axis, so this is just 1 over 6, 2 over 6 and so on. So the rise is actually in the center of the bending line, which is given with these values and I use, I have defined a parameter factor which is just used internally to make the definition of nodes a bit easier. So factor and rise um, are connected with this function. So that's all mathematics you want to see today. So we go back into our model and we go into the edit parameter dialog which we have just seen in the slide and I will enter my parameter rise, it's a length, I show you what's available in here, so you can change to th surface thickness and we keep the length and we change it to 6 meter to start with. I don't want to provide a formula here and I define the parameter factor where I define a formula, so it's 16 over 5, 5 multiplied by rise, that's what I've just shown you in the slides. So these are the only two parameters we need, so I click OK and now I'm going to define the nodes. I increase the tabular view down here, so you can always enter anything graphically, but you can always use tables as well, which are 
is quite handy in case of functions. So you see what you already did. You defined the 30 nodes here, and I go ahead with node number 14, which is at x position 10 meters, y position is 0, and here in the z coordinate will be defined with a function. So I click the button Edit Formulas and enter the formula I've shown you on the slides. So 1 over 6 is the first position, the exponent for minus 2 multiplied by 1 over 6, exponent 3 plus 1 over 6. So that's it. Don't forget to apply the formula with this button and now you see the first node appearing. So I close this dialog and I go ahead with the next nodes and this is kind of repeating now. I go into the edit formulas again and this is now quite handy. I can choose the last entered formula from the drop down list. So I choose it and just change my 1 into a 2. So that's all I have to do now for these for the five nodes I want to define. So you see the node appearing up here and I go ahead with the third one. Edit function again. I choose the last formula and I change my 2 into a 3. Apply this formula, close the window and you just see on the screen the nodes appearing and the next one is 4 over 6. So I apply this, close it, and the last one already at x coordinate 50 meter, 0, and the last function is 5 over 6. I apply this. So so you see the nodes of the arc. It looks quite reasonable. And now I use a spline to connect these nodes. So I go and choose spline down here. And I just click the nodes graphically to connect them with the spline. So right click to finish the command and right click again. So see how nicely shaped our arc is and this is just the line. So I have to double click onto the line and I have to make the member available. So I tick available and a new dialog appears and I want to use the same cross section as we have used before, so the TO1000. The material is set correctly so I just choose it from the drop down list. The member type is OK, so I just click OK. So, and this, that's it with the, the first arc. So, I now want to define the cables, which are in between here. So, I define a new single member, and I change my member type. So, cables would be available here, but actually cables as such are just to be used if you consider large deformations and this is not relevant in our example. So much better to use is the member type tension, which is a truss element um, that can only cope with normal for forces and only cope, cope with tension, so it can't cope with any moments or with any compression. So that's the perfect member type for us. And I want to define a new cross section here, so I want to use a cable material and a cable cross section. So that's a bit tricky to find in our FEM, so it can be found in here under solid sections. And I've made a pre choice here already. You can go down the manufacturer list, and I want to use Pfeiffer cable. It's a famous company. And cable PV560 is my choice and I want to change the material as well. So I create a new material, go into the library and here now I change the material category to cable and then it's quite easy to find. You have the cable PV company Pfeiffer here available in the list and I just click OK having all the materials 
material parameters. And that's me defining the new single member. And now I click graphically where they are. Here. Here. So. So that's us finished with the first part of the bridge. And now I copy the complete model as is. I copy it once in the y direction, 8 meters, as I said at the beginning, our bridge is 8 meter wide, so one copy in this direction, so the grid is automatically adjusting, and now please note, I double check this coordinates, and you see the v yellow triangle here in the top left corner, this means there's actually a formula behind this value you see. So if I click onto the yellow triangle, you can double check the formula. So what RFM is doing, as long as you are not copying into the direction where you have defined the parameters or the functions, RFM is copying the functions, not only the values. That's quite important to note here. So now we have to connect the two arcs we have created. So I will connect the the beam down here in this direction and I have to define a few single members to connect the two arcs for stability reasons. So I have to define more, few more single members. I go back to beam. The member type is beam again. I change my material so I create a new cross section again and this time I show you a different way of doing it. Much easier in case you know the, the correct definition so you can just enter the cross-section definition directly into this field. So you have a height of 800, a width of 300, and the, the wall thicknesses are 30. So, and you see what happens in this graphic here. So we change the material as well. We change it back to steel S450. So it's already available. We don't have to create a new one. And I click OK and double check what I've did. So that's the cross section, that's the material, and that's the member type. I click OK and I just define it graphically once, finish the command by right clicking, and now I copy this member six times in X direction. So the distance is 10 meter. I have to change to zero. Afim always keeps in mind what you what you've done as a last step, so you have to change it back to zero here. So in X direction, 10 meters, I click OK, and now you see how quickly this is, this is going on. So the next member, single member, is in here. It's just a wee bit of smaller cross-section, so same steps we are doing. I create a new cross-section, I type in the cross-section definition here, it's 500. 200 and wall thicknesses of 20. So double check again the graphic here. This, the material is the same. I click OK. OK, and this is from here over there. Right click to finish the command. And again, we want to copy this. But this time it's only five times and this stays the same. So all the single members are created. So we need, as I already said, we need a few single members on top here to stabilize the arcs. So I define again a new single member. This time I go again into, I'm not going into the library, but I show you a different option here. The most common cross-section types are available directly here, and we want to use a world cross-section. So I don't have to click onto library and search it there. I can click onto world cross-section here directly. And I want to use um, one with, which is 355, this one here, with a wall thickness of 8 millimeter. I double check the material, which is an S450, and I click OK, OK, again OK to close all these windows, and I want to define one single member here, another one, oh, this was wrong, so I just go a step back, and I create a single member again, 
it keeps the last settings in mind, so no problem at all. I just do it again from here over there. And now I want to define a key in here. And now please note, RPM is snapping the midpoint automatically. So I zoom a bit more in, hoping that it's easier with the snapping. So, and on we go. That's the key. And now, because I have um, just clicked on this node graphically, here, this is just a value. Please note that there is no yellow triangle on the top, top left corner here. So I have to click the V arrow here, edit a formula, and choose the formula which I need from the drop-down list. So this point needs the formula which with the 4 over 6. I apply the formula, and now note the yellow triangle. And the other node over here, we have to do the same here. So this is just the value. I have to edit the formula, and I apply this function. Apply, and click OK. Now, just to show you what we actually did, I want to change the parameter, the rise, to 9 meter. So just to show you what actually happens. So I click OK, and please watch the graphics. So, with one click, we adjust the rise of our arc. So, I go back for now. This was just to show you in between what we actually did. So, we are nearly done with the model. We have to define support nodes. We define nodal supports. The one here is just a hinge support, so it can't move in X and Y direction. This one this one over here should be able to slide in y direction. This one over here should be able to slide in x direction. Just to make sure, for example, if you have temperature or anything, you need to make sure that the bridge is able to move in those directions. So, and another one, I have to adjust this a bit, so I allow this support to move in both directions. Okay, that's us done with the supports. Just to be note here, you can increase or decrease the size. Just that's just a graphically thing, but sometimes it's quite nice, so we could decrease the sizes a wee bit. And the last thing we need to do for our model, in order we want to we want to use the RF move surface additional module, as I have said in the introduction. And to do so, we have to define surfaces. That's only because we want to use this add-on module. Otherwise, I wouldn't model any surface here. But because we don't want to model an autotropic surface, road surface right now in this webinar, we have decided to define rigid surfaces. So you don't have to do any settings. And I just define it in this one field. And to make sure that the loads are still moving as we expect this, we have to define line hinges. So I have edited the surface by double clicking on it. And I go into the hinge tab and I have to define hinges which allow rotation about the local X axis. So I have to choose the lines, which is this, 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 and this line. OK. So when I just click OK, and you see actually what happened to the, so you see the line hinges. So and now I want to copy again this surface. And to make the choice a bit easier, you can go onto Fuse. That's a quite nice tool. And I just want to see now the rigid surfaces. When I click this, you just see all the other objects hidden, and I'm not able to, to select anything now. I'm just able to select this surface with, together with the line hinges, and I want to copy it 11 times with a distance in x direction of 5 meter. So I click OK, and that's us done with modeling of the arc bridge. So I 
just deactivate the visibility mode here and save the model as a first step. So that's us done with the first big step. So I go back to my slides. We want to define loads now, and as I said at the beginning, we only define the self weight of the bridge and the load model one. And load model one is in accordance to the to the Eurocode one part two. So our bridge is eight meter wide. So we have to define two notational lanes in accordance to the standard. Each of the lanes has a width of three meter, and the remaining area is two meter, which we distribute on both sides. So basically we have one meter remaining area here, then lane one with three meters, lane two with three meters, and then another remaining area with one meter, so we don't have uh, lane three. And these are the loads we have to define. So there's the tandem system loads, which are shown here in the graphic. And here you see an alpha Q value which we just set to 1 because we don't use a specific national annex here. So this might be unequal 1 depending on the country you're working in. And we have a uniform distributed load system and the values are different for each, for each lane and for the remaining area. So we go back to, the, to our model and we start defining a new load case, new load case, and just by choosing the first, by in the drop-down list you have many pre-choices available and we choose self-weight and automatically you, the action category is chosen and the self-weight is active in the plus set direction. So I click OK and in addition, assuming that we have 30 centimeter concrete and nine, well, nine centimeter or eight centimeter asphalt, we, I apply another rectangular surface load um, being nine and a half kilonewton per square meter. So I define a surface load of nine and a half kilonewton per square meter. This choice doesn't matter in our case because we don't have any skew surfaces, but this my, yeah, so it doesn't matter if it's local or global definition. So I click OK and I want to apply this load to all surfaces we have. So I can just select all surfaces. So that's us done with the first load case definition, including all the loads. Now I want to define the uniform distributed loads as you have just seen on the slides. So I create another new load case and I call it UDL, Uniform Distributed Load, and I change the category to a traffic area, so it's category G we are choosing here. We could, I define the Uniform Distributed Load myself, you could use the RF Move surface as well to let, yeah, to, you can define it with RF Move surface, but as you will see later, our move surface is generating many, many load cases and you would end up having the uniform distributed loads in each of these load cases and I, I prefer doing it this way because it's not necessary to have the uniform distributed loads in, in 25 separate load cases. So I define it myself and this gives me the chance to show you another option. So we insert before we do so, I just show you again. So that's our here's the, here's the point where the coordinate system starts. So we have the remaining area being one meter, followed by lane one being three meter, followed by lane two another three meter, and then one meter for the for the last remaining area. So now we insert loads. We insert three rectangular loads, and using the dialog box. We apply the loads on all surfaces. This choice doesn't matter in our case, as I explained earlier. And for the first remaining area, we apply two and a half kilonewton per square meter. We apply the load over the whole length of 60 meters. We have to change now is are the y coordinates. So we start from zero. 
until one meter, which is the first remaining area, and I click OK and you see what happens. You get a load over the whole length from zero to one meter in Y direction, and by right-clicking my mouse, I can repeat the last command, and now I just change the Y coordinates from one to four, which is three meter for lane one, and I have to apply nine kilonewton per square meter in lane one. So that's the second load. And I just repeat this, change this back to two and a half for the lane two, and change the Y coordinates from four to seven, and click OK. And the last one, you could have summarized a few of these loads, but just to show you all the, all the coordinates and things and how easy it is actually to re repeat commands. I do it separately. So I just rotate it a bit around. So you see the two and a half and the nine kilonewton per square meter, which is the uniform distributed load system. So now we start with the RF moved surface module, which you find far down in the list. I don't want to see the loads for now. It makes me e makes it easier. So RF move surface. General data. We want to apply our moving loads to all surfaces we have. So we just click all. You could create result combinations, but as we are doing automatic combinations later on, we are not interested in doing this here, so we don't take this and we are that's all we have to do in the general data window. The next is sets of line. So we create the first set of lines, which I just call lane one. And consider the image down here. So we have to select a line or a set of lines, list of lines, and then we define an eccentricity. So what I do is I change the view into the minus x direction and I choose these lines. I go back to the isometric view and to I change the the model into a wireframe display model. So now we actually see the yellow, these lines are yellow marked, so this is my choice I did. So the numbers in here are the lines I have chosen and I click OK. And from this line to the center of my tandem system loads, the eccentricity are two and a half meters. And I have to decide for a moving step. I have chosen two and a half meters. Our fields are five meters long and so it's only of interest to apply the loads in the center of the field and on top of a beam and so on. So that's your choice and the smaller the moving step is, the more load cases are generated at the end. So and for the same reason to save another two load cases, I enter an offset, offset at start and an offset at end because it, it doesn't really mean anything for us to have the load applied on this beam. So that's the lane one and I create another set of lines which I call lane two and that's exactly the same what I'm doing. I select a list of lines, I change the direction into minus x direction, I choose this, double check by changing back to the isometric view, you see the yellow marked lines, I click OK. Now the eccentricity is minus two and a half because we are just thinking in minus y direction moving step and the offsets are just the same as we did before. So that's us done with the sets of lines. We go ahead to moving loads and I call the first one lane one tandem system and now we import these loads from the library and that's very handy. You have many many load models available so all you basically find in the Eurocode one so that's the load model with the tandem system only. As I said earlier, you can have the tandem system plus the uniform distributed loads. You can have heavy, heavy vehicle load models are available and the fatigue load models are also available. So for us, this one is important. That's the first traffic lane we are looking at at the moment and it's only the tandem system. Here, the width and the length, so the distribution area, is, is that's the standard setting, the default setting. To 
decrease the size of our applied loads, you can enter the thickness of this dispersal layer here. And I said it a bit earlier, I've, I've decided for 30 centimeter concrete and 8 centimeter of asphalt. So we end up with half of the concrete slab is 15 plus the 8. So we have 23 centimeter of dispersal layer here. And now you see that the distribution area increased, which actually decreases our load at the end. So I click OK and the loads are imported into this table. So without me doing anything, basically, I get the defined loads. So we do the same for the second set of loads. So I call this lane 2 TS. I go into the library again. I choose the second traffic lane and I enter my dispersal layer with 23 centimeter. I click OK. And that's me done with the moving loads. I go to sets of movement, lane 1, lane 1. So here, the, that's basically what happens here. It's just a combination of my defined sets of lines with the sets of moving loads. So it's lane 2 and this one. And I want to have the generated load cases into the category G. So the module tells me that it will generate 23 load cases and that it starts from load case 3. So you could change this value. I'm quite happy with this choice and I generate the load loads and Arfim tells me that it was successfully. So I want to exit the module so I click yes and I show you what the module actually did. I show the loads. I decrease the size of my table and I go through the load cases we have just generated. And I would just imagine you would have done it all by yourself. So that was quite easy to generate these loads. So we are nearly done. We just have to combine our loads, the self weight, the uniform distributed loads, and the tandem system loads. I go back to my slide. So, ah, I, I, so this is quite simple in our case. So you all know this. These are the permanent loads. These are impost loads. These are the leading impost loads. And in case you have more than one changing load, then you have non-leading impost loads. In our case, we have only one traffic load. So it's always a leading load because uniform distributed load and tandem system loads are always acting together. So the gamma G is 1.35 for the permanent loads and the gamma Q is 1.35 for the traffic, for road or traffic actions in accordance to table A24. So that's the only thing we have to change. You have C values for the tandem system and for the uniform distributed load system, but we don't need to define them as our as, as we only define one one changing load. So back to the model, we have to go into our general data again, and we want to edit the settings of the national annex. So you have access to all these partial safety factors to the combination coefficients and you can change all them and so we don't want to overwrite anything from the normal national annex so I define a new name which is just uh, this one but it's your choice I click OK and the only thing I have to change is the the gamma co for variable actions so I change it to 1.35 click OK you see the little star now, so this is our modified national annex, and we want to create combinations automatically. I click OK, the load cases and combinations dialog. So here you see all the load cases we have defined. Load case 1 is self weight, load case 2 is our uniform distributed load, and these 3 to 25 are generated from our move surface. We go into actions. And we should see only two, yes, so we have the permanent action and then imposed actions, which is the category G. And here now, it's the list of all these load cases, which are in category G. But as I said already, the uniform distributed loads is always acting together with one 
of the tandem system loads. So load case 3 to 25 are acting alterna alternatively and UDL is always acting simultaneously with one of those. So I have, because I cannot just apply one of those, it's not working, I have to choose differently and I have to put load case 3 till 25 into a load group, which is just one. And you can use the key F8 just to copy the values and enter a one here. So all load cases in group 1 are alternatively and UDL and group 1 working and uh, acting simultaneously. So we go into the combination expressions. This is the ultimate limit state. So that's the only thing we want to consider here for our webinar. So I delete those just because we want to make it as simple as possible in, in the webinar here. And I have to tell RFM that the uniform distributed load is always acting together with one of the tandem system load cases. So that's down here simultaneously acting load cases. So I have to define that load case 2 is always acting together with I choose one and deselect load case one with one of the load cases from the tandem systems. And I have to do it vice versa. You can practice yourself later on what happens if you have only one, but you need to define it in both directions. So 3 till 25 is acting always with load case 2. Okay. So we go into the action combination and now it generate, generated something. It's, so you have one action combination with only the permanent loads and you have another one where you have 1.35 the permanent loads and the 1.35, that's what we have changed, imposed loads, traffic loads in our case. So we, it's just asking if it's, so we are doing it right now and we end up with 24 combinations. And you can again see that load case 2 is always acting together with one of the tandem system load cases. The tandem system load cases are never acting together. So, and the result combination, that's just, you can have a look in details down here, it's just an OR combination from combination 1 until combination 24. So that's the only we are interested in, the result combination 1. So when we do the calculation for the result combination 1, so we let RFM do the calculation. So the main program RFM gives you internal forces, internal react, uh, external reaction forces and also stresses, but it, it just gives you a value of stress and in order to compare it with a limit state of stress. So in, for the steel, we will use our steel members. Just once the calculation is finished, I enter into this. This is just a small tool to compare to the, to the limit stresses. And this is just to show you that we are, at the moment, we have a parameter rise of 6 meters, or the height of the arc is 6 meters at the moment. And now our film is finished. So we, that's the global deformation we see here. And as we just want to see the maximum values, we are looking to result combination. So I can change the settings in here. I change the maximum values. Looks a bit nicer. And we have 106.4 millimeter deformation at the moment, which is quite a lot. And we can go into our steel members. And we are just interested in the result combination one, as I said. So, and in materials, you just see, I have still a concrete in here. I've never really used it. That's why it's red. And the cable PV, the, it doesn't know any limit states of the cable PV. And that's why it can't be used in our steel members. So that's, but that's okay for us for now. We just want to see if the steel members are actually coping with the loads we have applied. So I do the calculation and it shouldn't take too long because 
the result combination one is already calculated. So, and these are the values we are interested in. So, we are above one. So, this is actually not working. So, I go into the graphics and you can, can so it's not very nice at the moment. So, I go, what we see is the equivalent stresses. And I go into display and show the results on members on cross-sections. So that's a bit nice. So now you see the, the points where it's red, that's actually overloaded. So, and now again to emphasize how nice it is to work with parameters, we change our height of the arc to eight and a half meters. Afram tells me it has to delete all the results because we are changing something on the model. That's obvious. And when I now go back into RF steel members, will take a while because it has to repeat the whole calculation actually. But we will see at the end we will see at the end that the R bridge is now working. So we can lay back and relax for a few moments. And so that's us nearly done with the webinar. I thank you very much for listening and I hope it was helpful. And in between, while it's doing the calculation, you can just finish up with the slides. If you need some more information, you can always have a look to bluebell.com. You can always write info in emails to our support with info at bluebell.com or give us a call and follow us online. And there will be more webinars coming up, hopefully next month. Yeah, within the next month, we will show you a webinar about generational design of lattice tower structures using RFEM and obviously we do more and more later this year. You can always register as you did for this webinar and I want to thank you for your attention and just as the last we go back for a second to our model. Yes, it's already done and now you see it, it's green, it's below one so it's working just have a look to the graphics. So these, obviously you still see it's red because it's differently scaled now. So the maximum is 0.96. So we are below one. So and that is just just by changing one parameter without doing the whole modeling process again. And obviously you can define more parameters than just using the height. You can parameterize the width of the bridge or the distance between these members. You can basically parameterize um, everything. So I hope this was a helpful webinar and thank you very much for your attention.